Hello, Rebels of the Sharp Illusion. Normally, I start off this podcast by saying hi, but I'm going to start this one off by saying hydration. We know how important hydration is for our bodies. It's the thing that keeps us running, right? You want to be a well-oiled machine. You want to be running efficiently. You know what can help you run efficiently? Liquid IV. It is the category-winning hydration brand fueling your well-being and their hydration multiplier is the one product that you are missing in your daily routine. It comes in a little stick that's a powder and in just one stick you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. If you use it first thing in the morning maybe before a workout when you feel run down maybe after a long night out and doing a little party you know what I mean and what if you have like a long flight or something like that and you just right we all feel that way so add this to your water and that convenient packaging can go with you anywhere you go even if you're going to the gym or you're traveling or you're at work and maybe you didn't have a great breakfast at least it's something that will fuel you up in the morning and there's a whole bunch of flavors that are available like sea berry strawberry lemonade concord grape lemon lime pina colada tropical punch watermelon strawberry passion fruit guava acai berry did i say that right i never know how to say that but Those are just some of the flavors. Here's some statistics for you folks. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and even vitamin C. And we all know how important those B vitamins are. It's got three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients. It's non-GMO and it is free from gluten, dairy, and soy. I'm going to offer you a great deal, Rebels. If you go to liquidiv.com and use offer code Sherpa, you can get 20% off of anything that you order on that site when you're shopping for some better hydration. So that's Liquid IV. Check it out at liquidiv.com. Podcast that you're listening to is being presented to you in cooperation with the SJ Network. If you're a person who'd like to appear on a podcast, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network.com. Let's get on with the show. Hi, and welcome to the Sherpa Screening Room. This week, it's an interview with producer and author, Troy Devald. Troy has an extensive background in reality television. So enjoy the interview, or else you'll be voted off the island with Kim Kardashian, instead of a rose. Coming to you from Sherpa Chalet in beautiful downtown Mount Podcastia, it's time for entertainment interviews in the Sherpa Screening Room. Grab an aisle seat and a bucket of popcorn, but don't crunch too loud, or you'll miss the show. Now, he's your host, Jim, the podcast, Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels, and welcome to the Sherpa Screening Room. It is a presentation of Too Many Podcasts, the podcast about podcasts, and so much more. Jim, the podcast, Sherpa, coming to you in Sherpa Lou Studios, high atop Mount Podcastia in the Sherpa Chalet, looking out on this glorious sky in this December month, as it is, if you are listening in real time. That's what we call it, this December month. I don't know why. Anyway, hello. So we took a little breather these past few weeks and did a few rebroadcasts. One I wanted to do because I know people like the holiday shop and I figured I can help you out. So if you've missed that episode, go back on the episode list and check it out. It's a lot of useful stuff. And of course, we had a rebroadcast because I had a little scheduling issue, but nonetheless, I had something in its place off the ready with my interview with Dr. Paul Sutter. Now, if you thought that was a great interview, you got to check this one out. This gentleman I just met, and really fascinating, you know, reality TV, it's not what you think it is from when it first burst onto the scene and really became a genre onto itself. But I got to talk to a reality TV producer named Troy Devald, and he's been doing it for well over 20 years and really well-versed in that genre, and we got to discuss some of the mysteries or things that you might just presume about reality television that may or may not be correct. But he helped me set the record straight. Super nice guy. And not only has he produced a whole bunch of reality TV shows, he's also got a movie coming out, which starts filming in January of 2024. So we will keep an eye on that as well. 
And believe me, if it's as interesting as he makes these reality TV shows, you know it's going to be a good one, Rebels. So let's have a listen in the Sherpa screening room to my conversation with Troy DeVold. Hello there, Rebels, and welcome to the Sherpa Screening Room. We are here with a gentleman who has been a reality TV producer since 2000, and he has worked on over 50 projects, many of them that are probably really familiar to you, especially if you're living here in the States or maybe even abroad, such as this real life, Dancing with the Stars and Basketball Wives, just to name a few. He is also an author of five books and a public speaker as well. We're going to get to know him. He's got some really cool stories as the man behind the project, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Troy Duvall. Troy? As the guy they never show you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, good to be here, your Jim. voice now anyway. <laughs> That's all right. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. It's nice to be here. When I was getting ready for this interview, I was wondering, when you present yourself to people, when you introduce, do you say right off the bat, I'm a reality TV show producer? Does that kind of elicit some sort of reaction? I never say that right off the bat because I never know what the reaction is going to be. <laughs> okay. Usually it's, oh, I don't watch that stuff. And it's like, yes, you do. You just <laughs> don't know what you're watching as reality television. <laughs> So. They're, they're just reluctant to admit it anyway, right? No, we watch family shows like The Masked Singer and Dancing with the Stars. Yes, those are reality television shows. So what do you think caused that wave of reality TV when you first got started? What do you, what do you think kind of turned the tide? We got, we got lucky in the beginning is that when I started in 2000, Survivor had just broken. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was the floodgates opened immediately and everybody wanted to do reality television in the types of formats that you see now. Mm -hmm. um, things developed very quickly. There weren't enough producers to make it. Uh, so it was like a vacuum. Like I had been in the industry like all of 24 hours <laughs> and it was like stepping into a pneumatic tube at a bank. It was like, boom, you're a producer. It just it, Everybody got pulled forward really fast. So I think reality TV became uh, ubiquitous before it became good. Okay. And there are a lot of people that when they stopped watching reality TV, it was at the height of the era where all the humor was at someone's expense. And a lot of the shows were really kind of mean spirited. And that turned people off really quick. Okay. So it was just sort of like everything was like a meaner version of Candid Camera when we started. Um, and it's just sort of continued to blow out its proportion. Like, and, and and people, for some reason, I'll tell you this. Whenever I speak somewhere, I take an index card and I put it in my pocket. On one side, it says the Kardashians. And on the other side, it has a zero. And people say, oh, I hate reality TV. I don't watch that stuff. I said, give me an example of a bad reality. And they go, oh, the Kardashians. And I'm like, until recently, there was never a show called the Kardashians. It was called keeping up with the Kardashians. So you've, so you've never seen, you've never seen the show. And they're like, right. So I turn the card over and there's the zero. Like how many episodes have you seen? Zero. <laughs> it's just one of those things. They all want to jump on the bandwagon and talk about this and that and the other. And like, oh, it's just nothing but bad role models and people that, you know, people that you shouldn't be subjecting kids. Kids shouldn't watch this stuff. Like it's just a bunch of bad examples. And it's like, I know not everybody in the world is like reading scholarly media articles, but there's a guy named Henry Jenkins that I love. And he always talks about the audience use of the character. And it's like, not everybody's supposed to be a role model. And back when you were watching Dallas, I don't think your kids were like, I want to be just like Joan Collins when I grow up. <laughs> so it's the same thing. And I think people are people are slowly kind of getting off the horse about it. The novelty of beating up reality producers is is finally wearing a little thin, thankfully. Right. And and I guess if they wanted to be Joan Collins, they needed the big shoulder pads anyway. That's right. You can't afford that. You can't afford that kind of hairdressing. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely true. Now, you were um, an animator, right? Before... I was a comic book artist, comic and uh, book. I started out, I had a very small press called Acapella Comics. We did two or three titles, and they bombed miserably. My first title sold 166 copies. It cost me more money to print and distribute it than the book. And the only thing it had going for it was Weird Al Yankovic wrote the intro to the book. So it's like an oddball collectible for Weird Al Yankovic fans. <laughs> Uh, but I, it was one of those things where I came home one Christmas right before my first comic book came out. I didn't have super high hopes for it. And a guy I knew was writing TV commercials for Woody Woodpecker's 50th anniversary for Universal. And he said, you want to come work with us and write some of these commercials? Yeah, it's something to do over Christmas. And I just started enjoying seeing the stuff that I had put together become a commercial. And it all happened like in the space of like three weeks. Like, here's the idea. We shoot it on a Saturday. We're going to cut these things and send them out. And within a month, you know, we could see what the final product was. And I was like, I think I like commercials and TV wasn't that different. 
So I started making plans to escape to TV and film. I wrote a screenplay, got ready to move to California, drove cross country, and the first night I was in Texas. I hadn't even made it to California yet. I was on I-10, so tired, pulled off the road. There was a big cinder block hotel, or I should say motel, where I got my room key from a dirty undershirt that I could only see through a mail slot. Super classy place. (laughs) And the first thing I did when I went into the room was I turned on the TV and there was a show on MTV called Fear. And it was the pilot episode for the show. And at the end of it, the only name I knew in LA was a guy that I had known from the University of South Florida who had been roommates with the guy I did the Woody Woodpeckers with. And I saw that name and I went, well, that's who I got a call tomorrow morning. So I called him and he said, yeah, we're doing like eight or nine more episodes. Maybe we can find you something to do on the show. I said, sure. So I started as a logger transcriptionist uh, not that long after I rolled into town. And then that was kind of the kind of the beginning. By the end of the first season on that show, I was a producer. Wow. Like I, 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 I couldn't have timed it any better. And everyone was so lovely to me. It was just a great start. I was totally charmed. I guess I was supposed to be in reality TV. I never did go back to film, which was the original plan. Yeah, And, and I guess really... The- the definition of reality TV, as you as you really kind of hinted at it, it, it doesn't really have that one definition anymore. It's really falls under a lot of different things as well. It is. There's that huge umbrella of unscripted. Yeah. Where like the shows that I love, if I tell you, you know, somebody feed Phil on Netflix. If you've had a chance to see that, I think it's one of the best produced reality shows on TV. But people don't think of it as a reality show. They think of it as like a travel show or a food show. And it's like. Those are all reality. You don't have to be slapping somebody down on the boardwalk in order for it to be a reality show. Mm -hmm. There's so many different types and they do them so much better now that we're in this sort of era where it's not about being sensational and being the loudest thing on TV. You know, we can you can have a little more fun. You can be a little a little more gentle. There's a show called The Lost Kitchen that runs on the Magnolia Network that is fantastic. It's just a woman that always wanted to open a restaurant and she taught her mother how to be a sommelier. So her mother is in charge of all the wine for the restaurant. She does all the cooking and food sourcing and stuff. It's really neat. Hmm. And like I said, I mean, it's just like the quality of the shows has just gotten progressively better over the years. And outside of the fact that the production schedules have gotten so short now that it's hard to make good stuff because you just don't have time anymore. Because they, they know the shows are cheap. They're always trying to figure out how to make it cheaper this year than they did last year. So there's two guys running the whole show instead of six. You know, it's like that kind of crazy thing. <laughs> it's real life, Troy. When you're working with uh, th- different types of celebrities like that do they get overly conscious about how they're being portrayed is do they do they make demands like well i'll do the show but don't make me look like this or it depends on the celebrity it depends on the show i think the one thing that they did on the surreal life that was halfway decent was all of the producers on that show and chris abrego who has gone on to massive success um when he was on that show they do a good job of telling people how things are going to play out like they let a celebrity know we're going to need this from you we're going to need that they're not trying to do any big gotchas it's just this whole thing where like you know they're in on the process if the celebrity knows that you're not out to drive them crazy you're going to get a better result because they're not on guard and freaking out all the time that said usually about the first week of a show i mean we shot an entire season of that show in something like 14 days or 21 days Mm -hmm. it didn't it doesn't take very long to do that it felt really collaborative and like we got lucky on that first season is Corey feldman decided you know well i'm gonna get married to my girlfriend anyway like why don't we do why don't we have my wedding and it could be your finale. So we threw Corey Feldman's wedding to Susie Sprague at this beautiful house up in the hills in the Hollywood Hills. Mm-hmm. So, so it did fall in line with the with the way they were living their lives. It was just that, you know, yeah, it's just you're, falling you're, around. you're just saying like, give us as much access as you can give us to things that are going on in your life. And if they feel like they can kind of be co-conspirators with you and say, well, I got this thing coming up. If you want to cover it, I can get you access to this and then, then we can make it, you know, we, we can fiddle with it this way. And it all worked out fine. I mean, I, re- I used to run into Corey and his wife at the Ralph's the supermarket at Ventura and Vineland up in Studio City. And it'd always be like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I'd see you'd see Susie come around a corner somewhere and wherever she was, you know, Corey was going to be 10 feet behind. Mm-hmm. And he'd pop out and he'd say like, oh, you guys are making me look like a jerk. Like I'm watching. He's watching the show and I'm like, Corey, like I. I I can't use footage of you sleeping. So everything where you're awake, you're kind of being this pronounced personality. Like, don't get, don't get hung up about it. Like, we're not going to make you look bad. And he was like, you know, just don't screw with the, with the wedding episode. Like, don't make me look bad. I, I don't like to make anybody. If you ever watch any show that I've worked on, if somebody does something really terrible by the end of that episode or somewhere in the next episode, they're doing something totally charming. They're redeeming themselves. Mm -hmm. They look great. They come off smelling like my whole philosophy is they're nice enough to give us their time. Let's make 
them look. Yeah. And that does happen with a lot of reality shows where uh, whether they're celebrities or just, you know, a, a part of that cast, they end up becoming the the quote unquote villain. And some of them have seemed to embrace it. And some of them seem to be like, uh oh, oh, sure. Being the villains where it's at. <laughs> I mean, when we started, there was a show for Bravo that I worked on called Flipping Out. OK. Um, it's about a guy named Jeff Lewis, who's a real estate, uh, developer, uh, that he flips homes, uh, and it does a beautiful job of it. And when we first started working with him, one of the big storylines we had in the first season was that he had OCD and it's not OCD. Like your friend says, Oh, like I have to have everything organized. I have such OCD. It was to the point where just he just was completely focused on whatever he was dealing with at that time. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't handle deviation from a plan. He would give a lunch order and say, you know, when you get my drink, I want 85% Sprite, 10% fruit punch, and 5% something else. And you'd be like, how precise <laughs> is this guy? And it got to the point where she's like, he just couldn't roll with anything. It just was going to be his way or he was going to get really upset. Mm-hmm. And I was really empathetic to that. And I thought like, this is going to be great. Like he's, he's, he's this guy that's letting us see, you know, the warts and all version of himself. He's really, I mean, I thought he was a great guy. And then the seasons went on and he sort of kind of got into being a villain because of the personality type that people were perceiving him as having opposed to what was really going on with mm-hmm. him. And now, I mean, he, he just loves being super confrontational. If you ever listen to his podcasts on Sirius XM, you know, he's just kind of poking the bear all the time. I think he's a really neat guy. I think he's one of the most interesting personalities I've ever had on a show. And like you said, I guess as long as you're presenting him in that positive light, you know, and, and he doesn't seem to mind that, you know, I guess he's acknowledging that he's, you know, he has his quirks and stuff like that. And right. That, that's what you're going to see on and, the TV. And what you're seeing on TV is what he's giving. Mm-hmm. It's the same way. I mean, with any celebrity, it's that thing where people talk about, oh, you made me look like this. Or I used to hear people all the time. They would say, you know, I don't like this show because this, these women are being portrayed in this way. If you have a bunch of rich women that are tearing each other's hair out because of something somebody said on Twitter because nobody said no to them since they were 19 years old. That's that's who those people are. Sure. You're not making them look bad. Half the time you're trying to figure out how to dial it back so that they are palatable to an audience so that they don't completely turn on the show. You got to have somebody to root for. Have you ever had people say to you that, oh, well, this happened on this episode because you guys kind of geared it to happen like if there was a certain event or like a fight oh, sure. or or something like well, that. And this is the thing. The people that people always say, well, how real is reality TV? How real is this show or that right. show? And it's like, you know, sometimes we have to create situations because you can't wait around for a year right. for people to have things come up in there. You have to say, okay, well, you know what? You're going to, you're going to, you're going to host an, a charity event or whatever. We'll help put up the money to host the event. You can invite these people. You can interact. Or we'll say, could you guys have a conversation about what happened last Thursday? Because we don't have you talking about it on camera after the fight. Can you? You two just sit down or maybe have a lunch and talk about it. And we'll set up situations, but we don't try to guide the reaction right. on most shows. There are some things that you can see, like some shows that are really entertaining. Like when I watched, there was a show called Run's House that used to run on MTV with Rev and Run. And he would walk into a room and it would look like he was doing a high school play because they had like it was, they gave him the agenda for the scene and say, can you accomplish this? So he'd come in and he'd be like, hey, guys, what's going on here? To, what's going on in this room? And he looked so unnatural. Um, the end product was really entertaining because I think people were just excited to see him. Right. Um, but it's different. I mean, every sh- every show is different. The ones I really like are the ones where you just kind of wind people up and let them go, as opposed to trying to do it like an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. They're improvising within a framework because there's no time to shoot. Right. Uh, how do you exactly uh, like pitch some of these shows to, to the network? I don't typically pitch shows to networks. There are uh, usually when I get brought onto a show, it's already been sold and it's just, I'm there to figure out how to make it work mm-hmm. and how to tell the story and how to do the forensics of taking everything that we've shot and shake it out. So it falls into a show. Yeah. Um, but like most of the time when there's a pitch, the idea is not to go into a room and flood the room with the idea is you go in and you say, well, it's a show about this, 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 and this, here's how we do it. And then wrap it up as quick as you can and try to invite people to ask you questions because what you want to do in a pitch and people don't understand this, that they go in, they want to tell you the whole story of whether it's a movie or a TV show, they want to get in there and it's like, it's important to them that we like, we got to tell them the whole story. No, you don't. You got to get to the point where somebody's going to start asking you questions because shows get sold in conversation, not at the end of you just spewing Mm -hmm. an idea. Yeah. To, uh, To your point earlier about, you know, that you really want things to happen in the show. 
I remember a while back when that uh, TV show Big Brother was sure. first on TV. And that first season, nothing happened from week to week. They were really just yeah. laying around the house. And you notice that but from that season to the next season, you, you know, somebody in charge had to step in and say, OK, we've got to make these people a little competitive. We've got to kind of liven it up. Because sure. people don't want to watch people just sitting around and doing nothing. Right. Well, I'll tell you, um, Alison Grodner, uh, who wrote the foreword to one of my books, is the executive producer of Big And she's probably the smartest person I've ever met in reality. Mm-hmm. I did a show with her uh, several years ago that was called She's Got the Look. That was a search for models over the age of 50. Okay. And we'd put the show together. And I'd do the internal screening and I'd show her the show and she'd say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we did this? And I'd say, I could do that if we had something where this happened. And her recall was such that I can still remember. She would say, well, I think on the t- the, t- the Tuesday of the second week that we shot, we came back from lunch, which would have been around one or two o'clock. And I think this happened. I think you'll find it there. And it's like, I will have gone through the camera notes and not. And she would say, I think something like that happened around this time. And for somebody to have like that much recall of what she saw happen while they were shooting the show is unheard of. Yeah. Like usually you're dealing with the executive who thinks they saw something, which is to like, get me the shot of the guy jumping off of the DJ booth and landing on top of the speeding car. And you're like, I don't remember that happening. I remember a guy that jumped off and ran across the field and jumped on it. No, no, I saw it. I was there. He jumped off of the DJ booth and landed on top of the car. And you go back and you show him the footage and he goes, no, that's not what happened. And you're like, I'm showing you the footage. <laughs> like I literally just uploaded the clip to the internet to show you it didn't happen. And you're still going to tell me that that's what you saw when you were there. I, I know some of the books that you've written also have to do with uh, reality TV and even like when you're dealing with higher ups and when you're presenting you know, episodes like that. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is, is I, reality TV was kind of the big opus mm-hmm. is no one had written a book about the process of making reality television shows. So I wrote that. It came out. It was received really well. I got a lot of press for it. Um, but the book that really means a lot to me is a book called And Another Thing, The Beginner's Guide to the TV Network Notes Press. And there are very few people who need this, but the people who need the book really need it. Okay. Because I think a lot of people don't understand the notes press. And when they start having you give notes, you'll be like an assistant to somebody who's just been hired. So you're the brand new kid with a pair of $400 shoes that just graduated from Sarah job. And they'll be like, why don't you do the first round of note? And they don't know what to ask. And they don't know how to give notes that are actually constructive. They're giving these strange little subjective notes. Like, wouldn't it be great if her hair wasn't so distracting? And it's like, well, we've already shot it. That's what her hair, I can't fix. So it's a book that teaches people how to give better. Yeah. And and I guess, like, like you said, I guess there are always notes because do you think that the people that run the network look at reality TV and the process behind it, like different from like folks like you who are creating stuff like this? I think the people at at the network, they have certain expectations. Um, and while they may not always be able to articulate what they want in the beginning, they very quickly snap into a place of like, I wish the show was more like this. Mm-hmm. And then you end up like anything else where you're, you know, you're driving to a focus group in the middle of the night with six people who know nothing about television, who are just telling you that the characters stink. And it's like, there's nothing I can do to make these people different than the people they are. Right. What happened happened. That's the story that I have to work with. And I don't have an infinite bag of stuff to replace. This is my biggest complaint. I had a, an executive years ago. And I love to talk about this guy because he always complained about me after I I got fired from the show because I told him these notes, like if you're going to give me these notes, you have to give them to my boss who then gives them. And he would call me at my desk and say, it's very important that you do my notes. And the notes were always like, I don't like this scene, take it out. And it's like, I don't have like an endless bag of stuff that I could put in that slot and have it make sense. So I would shorten the scene if he didn't, or I'd figure out how to add some more interview or figure out how to jazz it up. And that wasn't good enough for him because for him, it was all about subjugation and, you know, I'm the executive, you're going to do my mm-hmm. So 13 years later, he's doing great. More power to him. He was 27 years old when he threw me off the number one show on a network. <laughs> and at the time, I think he was pretty proud. Okay. We we, were, we don't have to name names, Troy. <laughs> we're not going to name names. You, know, you notice how good I get at skirting around the outside. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it's like, if you know, you know. But if you don't know who it is, no, no reason for you to know. It's not going to make any difference to you. <laughs> So you're actually, you've, you've gone kind of full circle now, right? Because you're working on a movie. 
I am. I finally, I finally got uh, my claws into a movie. Is I started working with a company called the Big Picture Collective recently. It's Will, a guy named Will Clevenger and Sidney Brocious. Uh, the two of them did a movie with Terrence Howard and RZA from Wu Tang Clan a couple years ago. It was called Cutthroat City. Mm-hmm. It was received pretty well. Uh, did all right, you know, during the pandemic for anything. And they started this thing, and we found a comedy horror movie called Mutt. It's super funny. We're going to start shooting it in January, probably up some t- somewhere around Syracuse. And it's just, it's, you know, I'm finally going to get to play around in the movie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> are, are there any uh, TV projects that you have coming up or? Uh, nothing, nothing coming up. I have a, I have a documentary project that I can't really talk about yet. They haven't announced it. That's going to be shooting probably for the next three or four years. Like it's a massive undertaking, but we're funded. We're going to get started on that sometime early. So we're just we're just trying to do trying to do some different stuff. And because we've been able to find, you know, our own financing and the talent is is very big on the guys that are running big picture. Will Clevenger is a super personable guy and they all know that we're going to treat them right. So, you know, hopefully it'll be a great project. I'll talk all about it with you when it comes out. <laughs> OK. And uh, w- when it does come out, you can let me know and I can share it on my social media as well. Let uh let some folks know, because I know we got a lot of horror I'd, movie lovers. I'd love it. In all your time that you've been doing this, do, do you have like a very favorite special story in your career? I have lots of special favorite stories. I think probably my my very favorite story was when I was doing Dancing with the Stars, uh, the second season in 2005-06. We had George Hamilton was on the show. Mm-hmm. And I was a really weird kid. Like in seventh grade, my hero was George Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> So at the height of federal busing, I was getting bussed into the Booker T. Washington Middle School in a full blazer and a knit tie because I wanted to look cool like George Hamilton. So I finally get to the show. George Hamilton's going to be on the show. On Dancing with the Stars, I always said, give me the old stars. I know who they are. And with George, we would do the silliest things. Like right before we started the show, he like fractured his knee, like jumping onto a yacht, which is like the most George Hamilton thing you can do. (laughs) So the first couple of weeks, you know, we were trying to figure out how to do packages that we were kind of talking about it. And he finally came to me and he says, I don't want to be the guy that they only talk talk about is the guy that hurt his knee jumping onto a boat. And I said, no, like you're not the old guy. I said, you don't know this. I said, I admire you so much. I said, we're going to get really silly with this. And I said, just trust me, because if there's one thing I know about George Hamilton, it's if you know he's in on the joke, he's bullet. <laughs> so we did, we sent him to the zoo to find inspiration in an animal totem. We did all kinds of crazy things. I sent him to Beverly Hills to campaign for votes. And it's still the funniest thing I've ever done. <laughs> So he went to Beverly Hills and the first person he runs into, he's driving this convertible Bentley through Beverly Hills. And this girl comes up to him and, and she's just gorgeous, but very young. And there's this, just this quick shot where he's driving through Beverly Hills. We're talking about how he's going to campaign for votes. You know, the voiceover, we're talking about how he's Hollywood's hometown hero, all this other stuff. And he pulls up to the stoplight and this girl's crossing the street and he goes, do you know who I am? No. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so great. Because that's exactly how I felt on that show. I was like, I'm the guy who knows who these people are. I'll get them through in one piece. <laughs> I love so it. every year, yeah, I mean, I got to work with, I came back for season 19. I did seasons two and three. And then my old friend, Rob Wade, who had been my boss when I first started, came back to run the show. And I went back in season 19. And it's like, it's the only time in my life I've ever felt like I got to go back to high school and just have fun. <laughs> And it was such a great time. And Rob's now gone on. He's the CEO of Fox Entertainment now. Like, we're all just completely in shock that this guy that we worked with has, you know, drifted up to these this lofty position. But uh, he's still a great guy. Well, there you have it, folks. Part of all, we're going to keep an eye out for your movie. And uh, and thanks a lot for clearing up a lot of the mysteries that I'm sure people have always wondered about uh, reality TV. Is there what? uh, Sure. A website or or a social media where people can meet. yeah if you if you want to see years and years of just me musing about reality TV uh, you can go to realitytvbook.com. dot com can't make it any easier for you than that <laughs> uh, you can find me on TikTok you can find me on Facebook just use my name on Instagram I'm reality TV Troy I'm all over the place I can't stay off my phone <laughs> there you have it folks Mr Troy Devold thank you so much for coming on the show Jim it's my pleasure anytime. Be a rebel. Follow the show at Share Pollution on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. A very special thanks to Troy for coming on the show and helping clear up some of the mystery behind reality TV. And you can check him out, of course, on social media and keep an eye out for his name in the credits. 
You may not see him on camera, but he's definitely doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And just wait till that movie comes out, too. Ooh, I'm sure it's going to be a good one. And if you're enjoying the show, you know where you can hear us on podcast apps everywhere, you know, like the one that you're listening to right now. Or maybe you're on sharpollution.com, which makes me just as happy. Or even you, you over there with the hat. You might be listening on our YouTube channel. You know, it's audio only. You're welcome. Trust me. And <laughs> those are pretty much the big places where you can hear this show. But you can't see it. It's really dark on the Sherpa Chalet. Trust me. Trust me. Very dark. But we will be here next week with a new episode. And we hope that you will be with us. And if you can't wait, follow us on Sherpolution on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And I'm actually starting to reach out into that LinkedIn stuff. So people are going to say, this guy has a job. What is he doing on LinkedIn? I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to find out sooner or later. So until then, Mr. Bruce, we got to get on out of here and get ready for next week's. So until then, I see you a hearty Viva La Sherpa. Thanks for listening to the Sherpa Screening Room. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast. I'm Mr. Bruce, and this has been a Sherpa Lou Studios production. Viva la sherpa Lution. You know, Rebels, if you've been checking out some of my promotional ads on social media, you will be aware that I have been using a lot of AI programs to help me create ads. But you know what? There's a lot more uses for AI than just funny little videos. And I'd like to introduce one of our new sponsors, Podium. It is a leader in creating AI tools for podcasters. Now, let's say you've got a podcast and maybe you're even thinking of doing a podcast. You're probably wondering, well, how can AI be integrated with your workflow? I'll tell you about Podium. As a podcaster, you know that writing show notes and creating chapters and transcribing episodes takes a lot of time and it can cost you a lot of money too. But you know what? That's where Podium comes in. It's an AI tool designed specifically for creators and podcasters with the goal of making post-production tasks quick and easy. And in just a few minutes, Podium generates show notes, chapters, summaries, clips for social media, a full transcript, suggested episode titles, social media posts, and more. Whew, that's a lot of work for one little program. You're your show notes are key to your podcast's success because it helps new listeners find your podcast and they'll know if it's a fit for them. You know, it kind of like too many podcasts. It also improves your SEO. That's your search engine optimization. Ooh, big phrase there. And overall accessibility. And with Podium, you can focus on creating a great podcast and let Podium's AI do the heavy lifting. But Podium isn't just for solo creators and podcasters. It's a game changer for editors, producers, marketers, agencies, and production studios. Teams that use Podiums are able to increase workloads, decrease turnaround times, and improve their quality. How does it work? Very easy. First, go to Podium's website and you'll see that link that's right there in the show notes. You get three hours free just to try it. Pretty cool, huh? And using that link also supports this show as well. And you know what else happens? Because I'm a good guy. You use my link, you will get 50% off for your first month. So visit the site, upload an MP3 file, and download your files. And that's it. And if you need anything else, you can use Podium GPT to generate articles and any marketing copy you might need in seconds instant show notes transcripts chapters for your podcast or channel this will level up that podcast so check out podium today